All right. Welcome, everybody. Good evening. I'm Nick Bogart. I'm a museum board member, and our special guest tonight is Jay Brockman, professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at Notre Dame. Jay, you can say hi so your face will appear. Yes, hi. Nice to uh, see everybody here. Uh, in a few minutes, Jay's going to talk about how the Warren calculating engine worked and how it fits into computer history. Uh, the Smithsonian describes this device, Fred Warren's invention, as one of the first, if not the first, calculating machine built in the United States. And it was built right here in Three Oaks. And uh, starting tomorrow, of course, it'll be on display at the region of Three Oaks Museum. The first time it has been exhibited in Three Oaks since the 1950s. The most important episode in Three Oaks history entirely, of course, was Edward K. Warren's invention of Featherbone in 1883, which brought jobs, people, and purpose to this village and created prosperity for generations, really 70 years of prosperity. But a decade earlier, E.K.'s older brother, Fred, invented something no less amazing than Featherbone, although due to tragic circumstances, Fred's calculating engine made far less of an impact. Indeed, I encourage you to think about what Three Oaks might have been if Fred Warren had been able to develop his invention the way E.K., his brother, developed the Featherbone business. Frederick Parsons Warren was born in 1839 in Connecticut, though he soon moved to Ludlow, Vermont, where his brothers Edward, E.K., and Albert were born. Fred was a precocious fellow. As a young teen, he devised a windmill and put it on top of his parents' cabin in Ludlow, Vermont. That's Fred on the roof with his creation. I couldn't find any information about just what that windmill powered, why it was there, but I do know that he did not create a similar device for the log cabin just south of Three Oaks that the Warren family moved to in 1855 or so. Now, as a teenager, Fred got into photography, creating early photos called daguerreotypes and ambrotypes, these are pictures of his brother Edward, or E.K., as a 10 and 12 year old that Fred took when he was only 18 and 20 years old, and he was a teacher at that point at the Spring Creek School just south of Three Oaks. Fred was in the Union Army during the Civil War, didn't see a lot of combat, spent a lot of time at a, at a base in uh, a camp in Arkansas. Um, so he, he wrote interesting letters, though, about camp life, and a lot of those uh, excerpts are in the exhibit that we're beginning tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> Fred had learned to repair watches, and after the war, he built a shop, watch repair on the first floor, and a photography studio on the second floor on Elm Street. This is about where the old Lintner Chevrolet was next to Biola Restaurant on Elm Street. Fred Warren also published Three Oaks' first newspaper, The Reveille, and he wrote with real wit about the goings-on in the village. Again, our exhibit is going to feature, feature some of the... Uh, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, somebody, can you find, they could please? Something around the edge here. Okay. All right. Um, so again, our exhibit's gonna feature some of the articles that he wrote for the Reveille. Now, shortly before he went off to war, after reading about the work of the English mathematician and inventor Charles Babbage, Fred Warren got interested in building a calculating machine of his own. And by the early 1870s, his interest in it had become an all-consuming project. All right. Warren put together his first calculating machine in 1872, but he knew he could improve it, so he threw himself totally into that task. His second machine could do arithmetical problems. Though he wrote to his brother, Albert, I cannot call this machine a decided success because it has to work slow, and in some places where there are several carries together, the machine will stop. He wrote that he'd given up his day job to pursue what sounded like an obsession at this point. I found that my health would not... Uh, would not admit to the strain of old watches and machine at the same time. Company annoys me. I cannot bear to have anyone, anybody around. He would give up watch repair because his brother Edward, a successful merchant at this point, but not yet a hugely wealthy inventor, had formed a partnership. Their stationery proclaimed the Warren Brothers, proprietors of the calculating engine in Three Oaks, Michigan. 
Now, the Warren brothers were thinking less of becoming IBM than they were thinking of becoming a showbiz smash. They wanted to assemble a machine that would amaze ticket buying crowds with its mathematical aerobatics, acrobatics. I think a machine can be made that will astonish the world, Fred wrote to his brother Albert, who was out in California, hoping to strike gold of another sort. It will truly be a wonderful machine, as it does all that Babbage's calculating engine was intended to do, and much more. Fred warned Albert to keep all of this to himself so that word wouldn't get out as to what he was, what he was uh, working on. Um, if everybody could please mute their mute their microphones, otherwise it's a little hard to uh, to hear. Now, working in a room behind the watch shop, Fred finished his second calculating engine in early 1874. That's a picture of that there. Both the first and the second versions of the Warren calculating engine are in the Smithsonian's collections. In August of 74, he began working on calculating engine 3.0. That's my term, not his, as you might imagine. It consumed him. He wrote to Albert, I ought to get married and settle down, but this thing has got into my head and I will have to put it off for two or three years. But Fred Warren never married. He did not have three years left to live. He suffered increasingly from tuberculosis. His health was so poor that a farm worker named David Martin was brought on board to help assemble the machine with Fred directing him as to how to do it from a couch across the room. E.K. Warren, writing in early 1875, that the mechanism was so difficult, Martin can take it all apart and put it together, but still cannot understand it. Over and over, E.K. Warren implored his brother Albert, who had training as a watchmaker, to come back from California, where again he was prospecting for gold, and join the Warren Brothers Partnership. Albert, it is the greatest machine that the world ever saw. Fred never dreamed of half of those capable of doing, E.K. wrote. E.K. offered to make Albert a full partner in the enterprise. At one point, he reassured him, you could get the run of it in pretty well in a week. E.K. saying he had no aptitude for the mechanics of the machine. E.K. and Fred were able to get a third machine ready to go on the road for demonstrations early in 1875. In February, the Warren calculating engine was exhibited in Niles, just down the road, as well as in Morris, Illinois. Tickets were 25 cents a piece and 15 cents for children. Newspapers like the Detroit Free Press and the Berrien Record wrote articles about Fred Warren's invention. And E.K. wanted more, though. He wrote the editor-in-chief of the Chicago Tribune, Joseph Medill, hoping to get more coverage. He even offered to pay for the, the trip if a reporter would just come out to Three Oaks to see the machine in action. Now the reporter would have to travel to Three Oaks because by March, Fred Warren was too sick to leave home. He was living in his brother's home and work on the machine was taking place in E.K.'s dining room. Edward Warren believed that the machine was in fact harming Fred's health. The doctor seems to think, he wrote, that if he could have a change, get his mind off the machine, that he might live several years. But by the end of March, E.K. sent a telegraph to Albert out in California. Fred is worse, bleeding at lungs, very weak, dangerous condition. And because the Warren brothers were building a machine for display, for exhibition, there was a series of mirrors and some kerosene lamps inside of it to project the calculations onto a screen. E.K. complained all the time that the fumes really got to his lungs. So you have to think that it, the, uh, the fumes of the kerosene lamps probably didn't do uh, very, very much good for the uh, Fred uh, and his health, his lung condition. <clears throat> On April 9th, 1875, Edward Warren wrote to Albert that their brother was dead. An article in the Berrien Record just afterward called his invention the most ingenious calculating machine ever invented. And the article went on to say, it is so intricate as to be perhaps beyond the comprehension and understanding of any person or persons living. Albert Warren apparently resists all attempts, mostly by Edward, to lure him back to Three Oaks to work on the calculating engine. And as far as I know, he never struck it rich at gold either. Um, but E.K. did not give up on finding someone mechanically minded to get his brother Fred's machine to work consistently. He wrote to the Studebakers, the famous carriage-making brothers of South Bend, 
And Clement Studebaker wrote back to say that while the machine had a great deal of merit and that he hoped that E.K. could find someone to help make a great fortune out of it, that he and his brothers were in fact too busy with their own work to help out in that effort. E.K. also got in touch with P.T. Barnum, who had begun his greatest show on earth just four years earlier. But the folks at Barnum's Hippodrome replied that while the machine was doubtless a great curiosity, it should be displayed in a permanent museum rather than in their traveling show. A mechanical engineer named George Grant of Boston, a rather eminent fellow, offered to display the Warren calculating engine alongside his own computing machine at the U.S. Centennial Celebration in Philadelphia in July of 1876. But Grant had to retract that offer when his space at the Centennial Exhibition was cut back. Now, E.K. Warren hoped that Grant would at least write an article about Fred Warren for the Scientific American magazine to cement his brother's place in history. After all, a book written by the Warren Featherbone Foundation some 50 years later would claim that the calculating engine was at least 30 years ahead of its time. But Fred Warren was never celebrated for his innovation, and no more Warren calculating machines were ever built. Forty years after its creation, the machine wound up on display at the Chamberlain Warren Museum in Three Oaks. And when that museum folded in 1952, its collection, including the calculating engine, went to Michigan State University. Now, this machine has been sitting in storage at MSU until now. Uh, you see it next to a machine gun, uh, just, just uh, to the bottom of the screen. That machine gun also, by the way, is going to be displayed at the Region of Three Oaks Museum as part of our exhibit on the Red Arrow Division of the Army. <laughs> it's a Mauser machine gun from Germany. Uh, all this will be available for viewing Friday through Sunday, beginning tomorrow at noon. Again, our hours, noon to five. And because our 2020 season has been uh, truncated by public health concerns, we believe we're going to be allowed to uh, display the calculating engine next year as well. And of course, the irony of all this is that E.K. Warren, who said that this invention was too technical for him to ever grasp, he would go on to invent Featherbone, which brought him far more wealth and fame than Fred ever received. So what was the calculating engine and how did it work and was it really so far ahead of its time? For answers to those questions, we turn now to Jay Brockman of Notre Dame. I'll give a brief introduction with his, uh, his CV. He's a professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering. He has a bachelor's of science degree from Brown and a PhD from Carnegie Mellon. Jay developed Notre Dame's first college-wide first-year engineering program which I assume uses his book, Introduction to Engineering, Modeling, and Problem Solving. And since 2018, he's also been the director of the Center for Civic Innovation at Notre Dame. It's a very interesting program that fo focuses on using technology to solve civic problems and improve the quality of life in the South Bend and Elkhart area. So Jay, with that, I'll let you, I'll let you have at it. Great. So uh, first of all, yeah, I really want to thank uh, Nick and the museum for uh, bringing me into this um, project. We, uh, b before we knew we weren't going to be able to do this live in person, uh, we spent the day together um, up in uh, Lansing, you know, visiting the museum, East Lansing. And, and honestly, this was one of the most uh, enjoyable days of the year for me, um, not only spending time with Nick, but also um, getting to see the, uh, Fred's machine and particular seeing the letters firsthand and, you know, really getting to learn a little a bit about the, the person and his quirks and his family's quirks, uh, because really, I think, you know, lots of great inventions. We hear things like Ohm's Law or Newton's Law, and we think they're part of some pantheon, but they're just real people uh, like the rest of us that, uh, you know, have all of their foibles and weaknesses and quirks. And uh, it was really enjoyable to see, you know, that aspect of uh, Fred Warren. Um, a little bit more about my background. Um, in a previous life, I've been at, at Notre Dame for almost 30 years now. Um, but prior to that, before actually I went to grad school in Pittsburgh, I had worked for Intel. Um, and I was there uh, during a good chunk of the 80s. I, I actually started there the year after the, the first IBM PC came to market. So it was you know, an interesting time uh, to be at that company. And uh, since coming to Notre Dame, in addition to the Intro to Engineering course, um, I've taught the course that all computer science and engineering and electrical engineering students take 
Um, that's their first introduction to what goes on under the hood you know, of a modern digital computer. And, and most of them have no concept whatsoever, you know, goes on inside these things that they've been using a long time. And it's, it's really a lot of fun to, uh, to give that first introduction. Um, I've also got one patent myself that's, you know, for inventing a computing machine as part of a team. And we've actually started a company uh, called Lucata that's headquartered in South Bend, but also has an office um, in New York. And um, that made it, you know, particularly interesting to, to read through F Fred and his family's letters um, of them trying to achieve success with machine. Because, you know, I've, I know that life myself. And, you know, while we have a company and we've invented a computer, um, you know, we've, we've sold one or two things for sort of research purposes to universities. But we're waiting for that commercial breakthrough, too. And, um, you know, when I see the letter from the Studebakers, you know, or others saying, you know, interesting idea, not sure if it's commercial value. You know, have you tried, have you thought about contacting P.T. Barnum? You know, maybe it fits well as a sideshow between the bearded lady and the monkey boy. You know, I, I, I think I probably would have just, you know, drunk myself under the table at the journeyman, you know, had I, um, somebody had suggested that I, I try, you know, displaying my thing in the circus. So it's, it's really quite interesting. Um, what I'd like to do is, is say a little bit about, you know, where, um, you know, Fred Warren's machine fit in history. And while it wasn't a commercial success, um, I'm convinced that it really did have impact because of the correspondence he had with people like Grant and others like the Smithsonian um, mentioning his invention. Um, you know, we tend to think of inventions as being this big spark of inspiration. You know, an apple fell on Newton's head, you know, in a moment of inspiration and a eureka moment. But, but most things really don't happen that way, that there's this stew of ideas that, you know, um, moves along kind of slowly and, and new people contribute thoughts to it. And an idea that seemed crazy at some point in time seems less crazy. And finally, it gets traction. And there may be one person that was at the end of the chain that, that gets a lot of credit, um, but there's a lot of people that are there in the process that, that make that happen. And without a doubt, um, Fred Warren was, was one of those people. Um, so if I can share, I'm gonna start a little PowerPoint here too and um, show a little bit about where Fred's machine fit in history, and then actually give you a demonstration of a machine that uh, is a slightly more modern version of, of his. Um, from the 1920s that's very much based on his ideas um, and, and then talk a little bit about where things headed after that. Fred Warren's calculating engine. Um, so the first machine that, um, you know, really used the sort of technology that he later employed, you know, which was counting using gears, um, was actually Blaise Pascal, you know, a, a French mathematician in 1642. Um, he came up with a machine called a Pascaline, and what that basically was was this, um, which I think you know most of you probably recognize. You know, some interlocking gears um, that you have your ones column, you know, and your tens column and your hundreds column, and when a, a gear goes all the way around, there's kind of a carry mechanism that advances over to the next column. Um, the next and, and that type of machine, you know, existed and was in use for a while, primarily by um, scientists as an advantage over something like an abacus. Um, the next real major advance in this thread that we, is what was called the Jacquard loom um, in 1804. So now we're starting to get close to Fred Warren's time. And um, this was, you know, in the early ages, you know, in the midst of the Industrial Revolution, um, where people wanted to have, um, you know, more complicated patterns that they could put into fabric. And the real innovation about the Jacquard loom is something that you may recognize as punch cards, you know, which were part of computers um, in the 1940s, primarily 1950s into the 60s. Actually, they had a lifetime until the uh, early 80s when they started being replaced by other things. Um, but it was the very first example of what we would consider to be a computer program. And cards would cycle through this machine, which would basically switch what type of thread 
and what type of over under pattern you know would be there. Um, so that was 1804. Um, Fred's correspondence talks about what was called the uh, Babbage difference engine. And that was about 20 years after the Jacquard loom and Babbage's correspondence talks a lot about his awareness of the Jacquard loom. And his idea was basically, what if I married together the punch card system from uh, the Pascaline and that type of calculator, um, marry, that, marry the punch card system from Jacquard's loom with a counting calculator like the Pascaline. And this thing is huge. Um, it's probably about eight feet tall. This is a recreation that's in the computer museum in, uh, in California, San Jose, California. Um, it never actually worked. <laughs> it was an ambitious project, um, but they never really got it to work. The reconstruction that's in San Jose, if people ever get out there, actually does. Um, people were able to make it work. So in theory, it was a good design, but the limitations of the time couldn't get it to work. So it's right around here, you know, where Fred enters the picture. And, um, you know, Nick showed you pictures of his design um, where, he, where Fred's machine entered into history is, is actually very, very interesting. That um, while Babbage sort of saw his customers as being scientists, you know, that were, were looking to advance science, um, Fred came along, you know, as the industrial revolution was ramping up. Um, you know, factory production for things like textiles was happening. And what it meant was that commerce was changing from something that was unique to artisans to something that relatively unskilled labor, you know, could do in a uh, factory line for a whole very wide range of different kinds of products. And what that meant is more companies were making more money and you needed relatively unskilled people to count all that. Right. So while Fred's machine wasn't necessarily faster than what a um, person could do with, say, an abacus or um, or even, you know, for small calculations, tabulating with pencil and paper. What this meant was that um, people could tabulate bills, taxes, et cetera, um, without necessarily being math whizzes and without making mistakes. And so the basic mechanism, this is really a, a miniaturized version of what Fred's machine and, and also Grant's machine that Nick um, mentioned was, um, that was adapted to be a desktop machine for an office environment. Uh, this is called the Thales calculator. I think they started production maybe around the 1910s. This is an example of one from the mid 1920s and this is actually mine. Um, I have an example of one here, and um, if I can get, if you'll indulge me for a second to uh, set up a camera and stop screen sharing and do a few other things, I'm gonna demonstrate um, how you do some calculations on this machine. All right, so uh, this is the, uh, the Thales arithmometer or calculator. Um, which basically has the same machinery inside, which I'll say a little bit about in a second. Um, so what it has is a, a series of levers um, here that you can use to enter numbers. So as I move a lever down, you can see that it, it points to different values and that value shows up up here. We have different columns, the uh, ones column, the tens column, the hundreds column, and so on. As um, we go from left to right, and then we have uh, at the bottom, uh, a tabulator row. So you basically enter numbers with the levers, turn the crank, and it adds the numbers that you've entered together. It's basically the exact same mechanism that you would have seen in cash registers, you know, that, that came along a little bit later until they got replaced by, you know, the scan-based things that we have now. Um, so this is a machine that got, um, if, if Fred's work was the mid 1800s, um, it had well over 100 years, you know, of utility before um, it was replaced by something else. Um, but let's just show a simple uh, example. Like if I wanted to add um, 25 to 75, what I would do is dial in a uh, 20, let's, a 25 here. So I've moved the, uh, I've moved the sliders down to 25 and you can see the 25 up top. And then what I'll do is turn the crank once 
And you see I've entered a 25 down here on the bottom. Now, if I wanted to add 75 to that, I'd move this slider, whoops, from a, a two to a seven. All right, so I've got 75 entered. Turn the crank again, and lo and behold, on the bottom, what I have is 100. So um, a lot of interesting things happened. I had you know, some gears turning, all kinds of stuff. And it also was smart enough to uh, deal with the carry that went across a couple columns and finally got us a one in the hundreds column. So let me uh, show a little bit about what's happening uh, under the hood in this. It's, this has a nifty little mechanism that I can reset it and turn some wheels to uh, reset my numbers uh, as well. So how would we do, for example, um, multiplication? So let's say that we wanna have 12 times 34. You know, how would we do this the way that we learned it in, in fourth grade or so? Um, what we would do is um, take four times 12, and that would give us 48, right? Then we would shift over you know, to uh, the next column, because we're not really doing three times 12, we're doing 30 times 12. So we need to shift over by a column. So things line up, three times 12 would give us 36. And then you add it together, um, and that gives you a sum of 48. Um, well, part of the real genius of, of Fred's machine that also shows up in this arithmometer um, is the ability to do that. So let's do this calculation. Um, let me put my camera back on again. All right, so let's say that I wanna do uh, 12 times 34. Um, so what I'm gonna do is um, 12 times four, and then I'm gonna shift over and do 12 times three and add it all together. So let's do 12 times four. I'm gonna put in a 12, um, thumbs up, can everybody see this? We're good, all right. So 12 times four, how do you do 12 times four? I turn the crank four times, all right? So one, two, three, four. And if we look over here, there's a counter that shows I've got a four. So that tells me I've really turned it four times. And then I see my 48 um, down here. Now, this is the really cool thing. I'm gonna shift by moving the carriage over one decimal place. So I can slide the whole carriage, which is what um, Fred's machine could do as well. Now I'm gonna multiply um, 12 by three and it will just automatically add in there, but shift it over by a column. So I'm gonna turn this three times, one, two, three. We can see that I now have 34 here. So I've got 12 times 34 and I've got my 408 down there. So, um, you, somebody who is, uh, so now I can stop my sharing. So, you know, somebody who's skilled with a pencil and paper, you know, could have probably done that more quickly. And, you know, people could actually, some people, not me, actually could have done 12 times 34 in their head. But an unskilled person that's just capable of counting could have done this. And, um, you know, that's where it really enters um, into commerce. The, uh, so this was a machine that, uh, you know, appeared about um, the first uh, arithmometers probably started appearing about 20 years after Fred died. Now a little bit about how it works. So um, I, I can share the link to this in, uh, you know, the chat, but uh, how it works, there's actually a uh, YouTube video that somebody else prepared um, that talks about uh, how an arithmometer works, which also is applicable to Fred's. So what's inside? Um, for each um, digit position, the, the ones, the tens, the hundreds, and so on, um, there's a wheel that has pins. And when you um, slide the levers, what you do is end up obscuring some pins. And those pins engage with the counter wheel. So I'm gonna show a little animation. Um, there's, there's no sound to this, I've turned off the sound, but you'll, you'll see what happens. So, um, so when you turn the crank, the pins engage with the counter wheel, and that counter wheel is on the digit on the bottom. What the levers do is they obscure some of the pins, so not all of them are free to engage. So um, if uh, you wanted to enter a given number, um, only 
you get some rotations and each column has one of these. So when you turn the crank, um, that ends up turning all of those wheels simultaneously. Um, the carry mechanism is, is really incredibly ingenious too. Um, if we look at, uh, whoops, I'm gonna turn it down. At this picture, um, we have, I don't know why it's telling me unsigned it, there we go. Um, so we have this set of wheels with their pins that can be obscured that engage with these counter wheels for your ones column, tens column, hundreds column, and so on. And then this little blue piece here is what we call a carry interlock. Um, it's kind of like a little clutch mechanism that goes between the wheels so that when your ones column wraps all the way around, it causes the tens column to increment by one partial rotation. So if we take a look at that, um, you know, we can see that now your ones column is going to go all the way around and then it caused your uh, tens column to increment by one. You know, if we think about Fred as this, this watchmaker in, in Three Oaks, you know, with some skill in, in building gears, this would have pushed him to his, you know, limits and beyond, you know, applying watchmaking skills to something that had never been done before with lots of pieces, um, you know, all, all in the goal of this. So it's, it's really um, pretty astounding. Um, so where did this fit, you know, in history? At the same time that um, Fred was working on his counting machine, there was a group of mathematicians over in Europe, the most famous of whom was a man by the name of George Boole, that were reinventing math. <laughs> and um, math, you know, up to that point really had been based on numbers and counting. Um, and you have arithmetic and you have algebra. And what George Boole was doing was inventing a kind of mathematics that used some of the same symbols, plus signs, multiplication signs, variables like A and B, like you'd see in algebra, but they didn't mean numbers and they didn't mean counting. Um, what they meant were truth values. Something could be true, something could, could be false. And he found a way of putting together mathematical expressions um, that could determine whether different statements were true or false. And this became the basis of what we call Boolean logic. And it was putting together phrases with, with words like if and then and 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 or and not and trying to, to determine if these things were true. Um, so in a, and the kinds of machines that got built around this were not counting machines with, with gears. They were machines that let you evaluate if A is true and B is true, then is a and B true, and you could build these out of things like switches. For anybody that's ever, you know, tried to wire the, the switches in their kitchen where you've got, you know, one near this door and one near that door, that in order to turn the light on, you could have two switches that are connected in series, and if both switches, if and only if both switches are closed, then the light goes on. And that became the basis of the kind of mathematics that just prior to World War II, people started messing around with these ideas um, right around the time that this uh, Thales arithmometer was built, you know, in the 1920s um, into the 1930s. But it was World War II that really spurred things on for, for two reasons. There were two kinds of calculations they had to do. One was bomb trajectories from planes um, that needed you know, a different kind of computer. And the other was cracking codes. And so um, this notion of using the kind of logic that was being invented while Fred was inventing his machine came on in the 1930s. And interestingly, one of the most pivotal figures um, in the creation of the modern computer that really put the made the marriage between George Boole's um, work and these switch-based circuits was another young man out of Michigan, um, a guy by the name of uh, Claude Shannon from Petoskey, um, who was born in 1916, went to University of Michigan, then did his master's degree um, in the uh, midnight, early 1930s at MIT, age 21, his master's thesis has been called the most influential master's thesis of the 20th century. So it's kind of interesting how all things all come around to these little towns, you know, in Michigan um, as really being foundational, you know, to the whole um, computer revolution that, you know, today makes this uh, Zoom meeting possible. 
Um, you know, so with that, um, you know, happy to answer any questions, uh, anything you want to talk about. And again, uh, I really want to thank Nick and the uh, Computer Museum for, and the uh, Three Oaks Museum for bringing me into this. Um, it's, it's really been fascinating to learn about the history. Well, thanks, Jay. And I was, I was going to say the same thing you said, which is we actually really had a lot of fun in Lansing sort of going through this, uh, this invention, the files, the letters. I mean, thank goodness Albert existed because it was both Fred and EK writing to Albert that gives us a lot of insight into what their thinking was. If, if we'd had to rely on correspondence between them, we wouldn't have seen anything because they were in the same town. Um, there is a question in the chat room about um, how widespread was the knowledge of Babbage's work because uh, Fred did read about him and also was it a quintessential American thing of wanting to, to display the machine rather than you know use it as a show, piece of showmanship as opposed to something practical I mean how would you respond to that yeah I, I would you know that's a really good question about Babbage's machine I would think that it was a lot like other inventions that there were you know, specialists and curious people um, that were aware of his work, um, you know, since it never actually functioned, you know, its, its impact would have, I think, been at the time pretty minimal. Um, but as people go through museums and archives, um, you know, it was something that in time, you know, was discovered to be fairly pivotal. And um, actually the greatest impact that Babbage's machine had wasn't its mechanics. It was after Jacquard's loom, the first thing that was recognized as a um, computer program, and actually probably more famous than um, than um, Babbage was um, the woman by the name of Lady Ada Lovelace, who was the programmer for his machine, and she invented you know what was considered to be the very first programming language. She was the very first computer programmer. Um, and um, yeah, she, um, yeah, there's actually the Department of Defense has a programming language that it used through the 70s, 80s, 90s, and variants of it are still used today in the Department of Defense called Ada, which is named after Lady Ada Lovelace, who was the first computer programmer for uh, Babbage's machine. There's a question about whether, would you be able to try to fix Fred's machine? I, I guess part of the answer is we don't really know that it needs fixing. It may, it may be, I mean, if, if you were turned loose with it, do you think, Jay, after a little while, could you, could you run that machine, you think, based on what you know from your own fails machine? Well, put it this way, I am about the last person you would want to have, like, even try to fix a lawnmower. So um, I would be afraid of destroying the thing if I, I put, actually, you know, I, before this meeting, I was, really tempted to, you know, open up this arithmometer that I bought off of eBay, you know, to see how it worked. But then reality sort of set in and I realized I may not get it to work again. So, um, but there are certainly, you know, mechanics in the area that I think I would love to work with some, given that I have somewhat of an understanding of what it should be doing. Um, somebody who is really, a, I'd love to sit down with somebody who's a skilled mechanic and um, go through it together. But, but don't let me touch a screwdriver anywhere near that thing. Um, and of course, as a practical matter, this is uh, Michigan State's property. So the region of Three Oaks Museum will not try and intercede and, and open it up. It's, it's, in a, uh, it's in essentially the same case that it was in to display in Morris, Illinois and Niles, Michigan, um, you know, way back when. And there, uh, it looks as though you can open that case uh, we're not going to try to do that just because MSU, we, we've reassured them that we're going to take care of their thing, and I don't want to. I don't want to break the case. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to borrow it for a couple of years, but um, yeah, I, 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 there's no indication that the problem with it was was a functional mechanical one. I think it was simply just nobody else understood it, and um, you know, EK, despite all of his frantic efforts, couldn't find anybody with the, that kind of mind to come and bring their knowledge to bear. And, and he clearly was a smart man, but. Uh, yeah, it was, it was interesting, you know, going through um, the archives, um, because in the records, um, there are a lot of mechanical drawings that were drawn, you know, very, very skillfully. Um, 
but there's nothing that vaguely looks like a user's manual or an instruction manual as to how all those pieces fit together. Um, I kind of doubt one ever existed. I mean, I think Fred had this all in his head. And, and one of the things we were wondering about too was, um, you know, was there a local metal worker or somebody else that he, he worked with that actually cut the gears? Because the mechanical drawings had the look to them that they were intended for somebody else to do some machining work. Like, I'm not sure why, if, if he was making it himself, they would have been so painstaking, why he wouldn't have just sat down at a lathe, you know? Um, there's, there's a lot of unanswered questions. And, and in fact, there were two sets of drawings, one that was in pencil that looked like it probably was more his sketching out. And then there were some very precise mechanical drawings done in, I, I assume, pen or, or something that was inalterable that you, you theorized at least probably was the person, the fabricator's attempt to, uh, to show what he was going to make. Yeah, and actually with those early pencil and paper ones, I mean, the one of the most interesting things was he would have these, they were the ones that were before the mechanical drawings that were just the rough sketches on paper in yellow pencil. But then there were all these like fanciful doodles and everything that were on the other piece sides, you know, parts of the paper that you could hit, see that his mind was just flying all over the place, you know, while he was trying to figure this out. I mean, uh, just completely fascinating. And on one of those sketches, my recollection is there was a series of questions written, which I took to be EK writing down the questions he had about how this would work in case he came across somebody who could help answer it. And yeah, that's what we thought. Like, it looked like it was some of the, you know, paper and pencil drawings that Fred had done with EK's notations on there years later that are, what was this? You know, what was that? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if anybody wants to unmute themselves and go ahead and ask a question, that's fine. Uh, I, I run to the end of the questions that are on the chat. Um, um, if not, again, I'll, I'll thank you so much, Jay, for doing it. And again, your, your, not only your participation, but your enthusiasm for the project is really palpable, very encouraging, a lot of fun for me to work with. And uh, at some point, we're going to try and, uh, if public health regulation allows, we'll try and do this um, program face to face as well. And and uh, you can you can bring your machine and and demonstrate it uh, in person to people. Uh, Nick. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Hi, it's, hi Sarah Jakes. Mm -hmm. hi. hi. I just wanted to say that, and, and I'm sure I've missed um, key points here, but it's sort of while Jay was saying how wonderful it was that. Um, you know, all roads lead back to Michigan, and there were some amazing inventors in Michigan at that time. It's sort of sad in a way that um, that he didn't have, uh, you know, other like minds around him who could help him um, work on this. I know, you know, he tried to find the um, people that could help him expose it more, Bar or, you know, Barnum and so forth. But I think about now, obviously, fast forward, how many 150 years or, or 100 years, whatever it is, but you have these, you know, um, accelerators, right? Um, with um, all these great minds coming together to business accelerators to right. think, think through how to, how to, you know, help um, people who are, you know, have so much going on in their heads, but, you know, aren't ready yet or able yet to put it on paper or put it in action. And, it's, it's a little, uh, it's just a little sad that yeah. he was ahead of his time and living in the middle of, uh, in, a, in a sense, nowhere. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a wonderful point. I mean, so for example, you know, he went to Studebaker, um, you know, in South Bend at the time also, I believe Singer, you know, had already probably started and Oliver Chilled Plow. I mean, there were very skilled machinists in the region that somebody with some vision could have taken his fairly clunky thing, which, you know, never was going to be in its form a commercial product, but could have done this arithmometer 50 years earlier. Somebody that was, had those skills could have said, um, I mean, part of, part, of the, uh, part of what we saw in his writing too was one of his fatal mistakes was that he made it out of brass, which was just too soft a material 
mm-hmm. um, to be able to withstand. I think that was probably why it was so hard to get working because stuff just bent, you know, when you tried to use it and gears that bend, you know, aren't very useful. Um, but Oliver Chilled Plow, right, was making, you know, hardened iron and um, there were people that could have made this into a miniaturized, relatively lightweight, low cost, high volume machine if they shared his vision. But your point, Sarah, speaks to uh, to me anyway, to the the pace of innovation these days, because everything is instantly shareable around the world. Uh, you know, think about the effort to come up with a with a vaccine for COVID-19, uh, the, the amount of sharing and, and the, the impetus that that gives toward, toward finding a solution is, is really a considerable advantage. Yeah, in fact, on that one, there's a website, um, you know, which is hosted from Notre Dame that that's, uh, I could share that information, which is a COVID virus tracker. And there's, you know, more than a dozen efforts all around the world that are making phenomenal progress. I mean, when we watch the news here, they tend to focus on the, you know, the one company that's in the U.S. Um, but there, there are efforts all around the world. And those companies, of course, are collaborating, you know, um, that, um, you know, the likelihood is that there will be multiple vaccines, which is necessary um, because people have different reactions to individual vaccines and there's just so many doses that need to be produced. Yeah, he did not exist, you know, and I don't, you know, I'm not exactly sure how he first found out about Babbage's engine, you know, that was happening. In I, I think he certainly didn't Google it, you know. Yeah, no, I think he was, he read a book in the, uh, he kept pleading with his family to send him reading material while he was stationed in, in this camp at Pine Bluff, Arkansas during the Civil War. And it seems to me that it was right around then that he read about it. So maybe somebody just sent him Babbage's book. Uh, but, you know, again, this is 40 years after Babbage's uh, differential engine, difference engine. Um, mm-hmm. So it, it took a while for the word to get to Pine Bluff, Arkansas, for, for Fred to read. These days, that would be online in no time, right? <clears throat> um, anyway, unless I hear from another another quarter, I will thank everybody for uh, for tuning in. Encourage you to come to the museum, see it in person. There are several other really interesting exhibits. And again, thank you so much, Jay. Appreciate your your expertise, your input, and your creativity in, in yeah. imparting all of that.